everybody. My name is Kathy Cake. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of Allison Fine Arts. Our gallery was founded over 40 years ago in Hong Kong and is uh, really one of the pioneers in early Chinese contemporary art, not only in Hong Kong, but um, in an international scene. Um, so this evening, I'm really excited to have Malcolm here, Malcolm McNeil, who is a uh, uh, lecturer, senior lecturer, and so as um, Malcolm was the director of the SOAS Alpha Wood Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art and senior lecturer in arts education at SOAS University. And he joined SOAS from Christie's, where from 2017 to 2020, he was a specialist in Chinese painting responsible for the European market. Malcolm also worked in a curatorial position, uh, curatorial research and public access roles at leading museums and cultural institutions in the UK and Asia. These include Asia House here in England, uh, British Museum, the National Palace Museum in Taipei, as well as the Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, Malcolm holds a PhD from SOAS and a master's from SOAS in the history of art and archaeology, and a master's from Cambridge in Oriental Studies Chinese. He has a strong research and teaching interest in Chinese and Buddhist visual culture, text image relations, and in the study of curation and <laughs> So this evening, really excited. He's going to be talking about media and materiality in Chinese contemporary art. So uh, but before he starts, I just want to say the talk is going to be about 45 minutes long, and then we will have a Q&A at the end of about 15 minutes. So maybe if you do have questions, you can come to it. Um, well, Daphne, thank you so much for the, the invitation. Um, hello and welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you also to, to David for his extensive support in setting all this up. And indeed, hello to everyone joining us online. Um, it really is a pleasure and a privilege to be invited to come and speak to you this evening on, on this topic in, in this room. And I'm very much here, not as a kind of, and in spite of what the um, extensive biography, which to be honest, I didn't realize that Daphne was going to read in its entirety. <laughs> I thought it was for the website. Um, <laughs> so given, given the kind of the, the, the rhetoric that may have come across there, I am not here to kind of speak as an authority with a voice over the works. I'm here as a catalyst for a conversation with the real stars of the show. And they are not in front of you on the screen, they are around you on the walls here. So this is very much, um, I want to think of, I think of my role here as a, as a catalyst for conversation and exchange and to invite you at the end of this session to stay, linger and look and look long because these works will give you more than you expect in the first glance. So that's my, my kind of opening caveat. And um, so what I'm actually going to be talking about with this, this aim to stimulate conversation today, at the core of my presentation is a really rather deceptively simple question in, in contemporary Chinese art with me. Or perhaps more accurately, what does the word Chinese in Chinese contemporary art do? What does it tell us? How does it guide us? How does it shape, formulate, or inform our preconceptions of what we are looking at when we look at a Chu Chu, um, a Li Chun, a Wang Tian, or a Cherry Chu? So, of course, it indicates origins and cultural affiliations, um, but it also guides us in a way. Um, it links us to not only the kind of cultural space of China in the People's Republic of China, but to greater China as it's construed today, um, and to the diverse range of kind of people's cultures and expressions that come from there, as well as the global diaspora, and crucially, the peripatetic lives of the contemporary artists represented in this room and in the broader field indicated by this term. So let's come back to this particular term. How many of the artworks here do we wish to review or label, or perhaps even define through their ethnic and cultural origins? What do we stand to gain by adding that signifier of Chinese? And what do we stand to lose um, if we remove it? Or indeed, what do we stand to gain by removing it as well? And referring to them simply as, bear with me as the PowerPoint loads, contemporary artists, or referring to these works as contemporary art. And before I go into kind of exploring this through a more substantive engagement with the works on the walls around us, I want to kind of, perhaps with tongues slightly lodged in my cheek, give a quick illustration of the stark disparity that can arise from omitting the label Chinese when talking about contemporary art. 
this image that I've picked for you is not something I've carefully curated to communicate a cultural stereotype or cultural stereotyping. This was generated by the artificial intelligence that underpins Microsoft PowerPoint's um, automated suggestions. So when I gave the AI the term Chinese contemporary art, it gave us an image of a gabled pavilion on a tranquil lake with a distant landscape on a misty shore and an, anonym and, an and an anonymized figure blurred and invisible within the confines of the pavilion. This is what ChatGPT, or its, its close relation, has provided for us when we start with this term today. But if we omit Chinese, we are confronted with something very different. The focused mechanical gaze of a camera lens with nothing culturally specific and nothing even in the blurring of the reflection in the lens that locates this concept geographically or culturally. We are in a mechanized age of shared modernity and contemporaneity. So in exploring this topic, there, are, there is clearly something at stake in the inclusion or omission of the term Chinese as a preface to this conversation. But I've kind of said enough about that already. I think I've made my point and then doubled down on it a bit much. So you probably want to see a few more of the works that we'll be looking at here. So my topic is media and materiality. Uh, but we're not going to be delving into cultural theorists and so on. I want to remain anchored in the objects that surround us. As I said, I'm here as an interlocutor and a catalyst for examination. So I've structured my talk around five different aspects and material aspects that connect and are found across the world. So please come in. I'll be talking about ink, about paper, about colour, about photography, and about oil. And throughout the talk, I've added Chinese terms and characters here, not simply as an act of translation, but as a graphic and visual reminder, even for those of us who don't speak Chinese, that the cognitive mechanisms, the language of thought, the vehicle of thought for the majority of these artists is in the Chinese language. So conceptually, there is perhaps a, occasionally some degree of bridging that may take place between the English terms that I'm speaking to you here and the ways in which, in their internal monologue, the artists may conceptualize or speak openly about their work as well. So let's start with ink. The condensed remnants of carbonized pine soot held together with animal glue, in most instances, in the, in the traditional media, and the substrate for a transformative cultural form of, transformative cultural forms of calligraphy and painting in elite discourses throughout dynastic China. So a very loaded material in many senses, but something that has been actively taken up, manipulated and reinvented and reinvigorated by modern and contemporary artists in China broadly construed. So who better to start with for that than Liu Shouquan? And you can look at the slide here, or you can look beyond the slide and see the actual work on the wall behind. Liu Shouquan was born in Guangzhou in 1919 and came to Hong Kong in 1948. And in Hong Kong, he has left a lasting legacy that is growing in its resonance around the world as the father of what's termed the Hong Kong New Ink Movement, or the New Ink Movement in itself. In his practice, he made a radical departure from his formal training in the conventions of traditional media and the meticulous study of Qing Dynasty masters like Shu Pao and others in reimagining re re Guohua painting in, um, or traditional media painting in a manner that was markedly distinct to the time and place in which he did it, and it created a profound legacy both in the lineages of students that followed him in Hong Kong, but also in now in global conversations and discourses around the world, attested by the recent exhibition um, that closed just a few months ago in Chicago. So when we look at this painting, we see something that is initially overtly a landscape, but represented with a consciousness and indeed a deliberate engagement with the potential, if not the reality, or the, not the full realization of abstraction. And I'm, I'm not saying this is an abstract painting here by any stretch. We will come to abstraction later, and I want to really emphasize that this is figurative in the sense that it, it represents a defined and is conceptualized as a landscape, but the the use of wash, of gesture, of um, indicative form, rather than purely descriptive form, is something that draws on a deep heritage, but also represents a profound innovation. 
And indeed, perhaps one of the most pronounced expressions of that is in the way that Liu Xiaoquan used ink and ink painting to explore religious and philosophical themes connected to Zen Buddhism, or Chan Buddhism, as it's known in Chinese, a distinction I would, I would emphasize. Um, and also Taoist philosophies as well. So here in the image on the right, also we just passed through the hands, or perhaps still in the care of Alice and Gallery, um, you have a, a wonderful iteration of uh, one of the more active and kinetic Zen paintings by um, Liu Shokan. You see the deconstructed, blossoming lotus flower as a signifier for Buddhist awakening, the, the blossom that rises through the muddy waters of samsara and blooms in the bright sunlight of nirvana, but here represented through idioms that are often read or perhaps over-read as derivative or in dialogue with abstract art, whereas in fact many of the inspirations and sources, the, the intellectual engine that underpins the frenetic energy and centered meditative quality of the image on the right does not come from a, a borrowing from, um, from ateliers in, in New York. It comes from the artist's deep engagement with the specific and now global uh, philosophies of Chan, Zen, and Taoism. So let's move on from Liu Xiaoquan to look at another example. And the next slide will kind of give you an image. But if you want to turn your heads behind you on the, the back of the wall, we're, we're moving on to look now at Lin Guocheng born in Guangdong in 1979. And now I think hopefully Liu Shuquan has really underscored for us the, the metaphysical, metamorphic, and transformative power of ink. Uh, but in Lin Guocheng's hand, it, it's used for a very different purpose, a much more overtly syncretic one, when we talk about materiality, and the materiality of the tools as well as the, 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 the pigments of the artist. Um, as we can see here, this is a, a work that combines Chinese ink and pen um, on, and watercolour on paper. So we see this here as a, um, sorry, no, this, I believe this one actually doesn't have the watercolour included. It's my, my error in the captioning here, so apologies. This is an, this is an ink drawing, an ink pen drawing, using a mechanised, um, a, a, a kind of traditional hard nibbed pen rather than a flexible animal hair brush. So in um, Lin's oeuvre, uh, the artist born in Guangdong in 1979 and educated in the Sichuan Fine Art Academy, you see this blending of both material and technique. Material here in the sense that the ink carries a profound cultural signification, um, but also the technique in that this is executed through the nib of a pen rather than the hairs of a brush, um, and produced with the deliberate deployment and depth deployment of a vanishing point perspective in the creation of this architectural space around the image. Um, and uh, and um, Daphne and David very generously put me in touch uh, with the artist indirectly to clarify my own reading of this. And he, he put forward the view that this image, as the title indicates, mindfulness graph, or it's called one, should be seen as a, a kind of indicator of a contemplative state of mind um, and a catalyst as such. The image of the, tree, the, the conjoined trees at the center is, is not at the foreground of the artist's intention. So we're, we're not supposed to think about necessarily the um, the symbolism or signification of conjoined and, and, and um, trees that grow together, lilian shu in Chinese, a common motif for harmony um, in, in imperial China. But instead, this is an image that focuses our attention, not on a necessarily particular image, but on the act of focusing attention itself. Thank you so much. And it does so through a synthesis of technique and material. But where does that come from? So again, I, as someone who has a bit of training in classical Chinese painting as well, I couldn't resist drawing a, a perhaps um, not particularly academic formalist parallel between this work and another work that I'll be speaking about later this week um, in Cleveland, um, seen on the right-hand side of this, um, this slide. So the image here provides for us, and I'm presenting this not to say that um, Lin Guocheng is, is emulating Chan or Zen painting overtly. He's not engaging with it in the same kind of active and deliberate form of intellectual heritage that we see in the writings and the practice of Liu Shu. But what this communicates to us, and particularly for those of us who, like me, did not grow up in a Chinese-speaking environment, whose natural language of cognition is not Chinese, um, and who do not have a cultural background that makes the notion of meditative concentration and, and its associations with Buddhism immediately accessible, this image is here as a kind of entry point for those of you who, who like me, come from that starting point. In essence, it's a way to make this a bit more kind of locally legible here in London. 
we see the seated figure of Bodhidharma, the first patriarch of Chan Buddhism, facing the, um, the absent cliff of the, uh, of the Shasha cliff above the Shaolin Monastery, a place where he spent nine years in, in dedicated meditative concentration. And in the image um, from the uh, Lingo Chung painting, or Lingo Chung drawing, perhaps we should say, we see an overt parallel that may just get your attention in the lower right hand corner here. So it's slightly pixelated in the image, but do go and look in a second, where the silhouette of the figure, its grounded gravity in the lower register, um, positions it in a manner that is at least iconographically, if not consciously, perhaps subconsciously, creates a parallel between the kind of iconography we see on the right and the image on the left but done through a radically different form of technique and presented in a radically different format with none of the prescriptive um, didactic uh, quality that accompanies a, a Buddhist religious image in Song Dynasty China. But another thing I want to draw your attention to in the innovative way in which um, Lin has depicted this isolated figure here is that the figure is not rendered in ink. <coughs> the figure is rendered as a visible absence of marks on the artwork surface. He appears through the unmarked surface of the paper, the reserve white or liu bai technique. And it's that media, um, that transformative and hugely significant media that I want to move on to speak about now. So paper is a deceptively simple topic to cover here. Um, but I'm gonna speak about it as, a, as both a conduit but also an active agent for the, um, for the creativity, the invention, and the experimentation of some of the artists in this room. And I want to begin with another artist who has a very classical flavor to their work. And it may seem like I'm kind of very much favoring those, um, those elements with historic illusions here in a conversation about the contemporary, but bear with me, we will, we will get to something that is more, more in that vein. This image by, um, this, this work by Wang Tiendo, which you can see in the back right hand corner of the room here, is executed in a, in a manner that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that may be quite surprising for those who are not immediately familiar with his work. Born in Shanghai in 1960, the artist studied in Shanghai and Hangzhou, and perhaps one of his greatest contributions to image making, or we might broadly construe as painting, um, is the innovative use of incense sticks, not to um, uh, to actively not to mark, but to, to mark through, not to mark through an active addition to the paper, but to mark through burning. So essentially the creation of negative space that you see across these layered elements of the paper uh, that we find here. So the work as a whole has a very clear antiquated, antique flavor, the rubbing of Qing Dynasty calligraphy um, as part of the work on the left, and the image on the right that contains this evocative landscape which is produced with a layering of paper, um, one sheet to top the other, where images move through the translucency of the support and also break through the translucency of the support through the artist's active intervention with the intensity. And the development of this technique is, is hugely significant, is widely celebrated in the institutional collections that house his work across the world, but also represents for us an important kind of departure from the traditional media in, in this sense. The use of the, the burning kind of speaks to a, a specific practice to the artist. And indeed, the way he's developed this over the years, you see a kind of refinement, a, a nuance, a, a kind of greater degree of control of that burning was not necessarily so, so, so specific in the visual effects it could achieve in its earliest instances. As with anything, coming back to this form of technique and practice has enabled um, Wang Tiendo to achieve new things with his manipulation of the material. And you can see that very clearly in the lower register of the work, where in fact these two boating figures are so deftly executed in the outline of the, in the, in the burns into the paper surface here, and have implied and evoked in a very scholarly fashion, um, or a style of scholarly painting. And um, one thing I find particularly, um, if it's not too patronizing, say charming or evocative or, or effective about this, is the manner in which the artist has used the residual edges of the burnt paper to create a pronounced outline around the figures, emulating something that appears at first glance to be like an ink painting in, its, in that sense, but actually departing from it quite radically by using negative space rather than an active intervention on the paper surface. And you see that executed to a kind of rich degree of complexity here in this tree that appears in the upper right center. If you look at the uh, the trunk wending up towards the right of that pine overhanging the bridge, 
you'll see there's such a, a, a rich, almost three-dimensional combination of um, negative space through the burnt paper, the residual line of the burning itself, the um, echoes or, or kind of the, the, the peering through of the, the underlying ink drawing, as well as the painting that is applied to the, to the surface of the work. So this is a profoundly complex and intellectually sophisticated way of dealing with this, this topic. Or doing something different than the artist's practice. I want to move on now to another artist who, in age, is a near contemporary of Wang Tiendo, Li Jun Yi, um, who was born in, um, uh, in Taiwan and moved to Hong Kong at a young age, studying in Hong Kong and the US before relocating to, um, uh, to Taiwan, where he has developed his practice extensively over the years. And as some of you, I think, may have been discussing with, with Daphne before the talk started, he has a, a very distinctive way of making paper central to his artistic practice. In in, in creating these handmade pieces of paper himself that he impresses repeatedly with hand-carved softwood and at times I believe also cork, um, or what, are, what are often described as seals or kind of stamps, you could say, that play on the idea of the, the impressed image, a kind of an injunction to go beyond the, the, kind of the limitations of ink and to seek innovation and new kinds of practice that in this case are rooted in materiality and specifically the materiality of paper. And the ink-like landscape is in fact not ink, it's gunpowder and, uh, and magnetic pigments applied to the, to the surface here. And while the kind of initial glimpse of this is a kind of structurally broken down allusion to, to ink landscape perhaps, um, and it has resonances in this earlier oeuvre with the explicit citation of classical poetry and, and comments on classical painting and poetry's interrelation, this work, um, uh, Poetry and Painting, uh, is, takes its title from the very often quoted um, sort of mot juste by Su Shi, the preeminent Song Dynasty literati, who commented on Tang Dynasty artist Wang Wei's painting that there is poetry in painting and painting in poetry, a kind of integration of the elite and polite arts. And that, that kind of classical reference perhaps resonates in this work by Li Junji through the addition of these, um, these Chinese characters as the elements that are impressed across a grid like structure. But we're seeing a kind of a rising sense of irony and humour, perhaps, in, in this work here, in Lucini's later practice, or, or current practice, we should say. Um, so if you look here, I mean, what, it's entitled An Emoji Landscape, and it's really overt when you look closely at each individual section here, these powerful, um, kind of immediately legible images that are you know, so familiar to us today, um, and create this kind of tension in the work that plays with the viewer's expectations. Um, and plays to some extent with the artist's relationship to us in that sense, kind of subverting what we might expect of him. Now I want to move on with another example coming from Li Junyi's practice and, and talk briefly about colour. And here I've chosen in the Chinese term something that speaks to, uh, referring to it as si, as something that speaks to it not only as a, how should we put this, not, not only as a kind of pictorial quality, or a visual quality, but actually has connotations in, in the Chinese language of, um, of sexuality, of, of visceral bodily connections between the kind of sensation and, and color here. So this is, this is a deliberate kind of connection perhaps to the potential of color within an artwork to add a, a different dimension to the very cognitive and perhaps metaphysical or meditative qualities that we've been seeing in the, in the materiality of ink. There is a kind of different register we're moving into when we, we talk about works in color here. Um, and that could not be more apparent than in uh, Li Chun Yi's wonderful work, which again, I encourage you to look up to your right rather than at the screen here, um, where again the artist has doubled down on the capacity of the, of the media um, and also the kind of playful irony embedded in this current practice. Uh, the work is a significant departure from. Um, from the earlier um, floral images that were often produced in monochrome ink, and here this addition of old, bright paint through acrylic and Japanese mineral pigments adds something really significant to, to the work. It, it brings a kind of imminent present to us, presence to us that is, um, uh, is quite impactful for, for us as viewers and, and shows something of the artist's intention to move beyond the prior expectations we have had. Um, also, when you look closely, and I'm not sure if many of you can see either here or, or up there, the, the impressed designs here within the handmade paper, made with these seals meticulously carved by the artist himself, are, 
are, no, are neither emojis nor are they those classical Chinese characters and poetic illusions. These are the logos of luxury brands. And I'm really grateful to David for kindly picking them out for me. Um, as um, honestly, the, the, the kind of the range of, 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 of logos and brand names is, is slightly beyond my um, iconographic expertise as an art historian, not to speak of my budget. Um, but nonetheless, you, you, you get the point here, right? This is, this is tongue firmly in cheek, bold, sensuous, colorful, linked to the artist's prior practice, but developing it in whole new directions, which are really putting on the threat, you know, they're, they're asking something very direct of us. And I said this, is, this talk is meant to be a catalyst to put you in conversation with the work. Here the artist is very much kind of reaching out to us and asking questions of, of the collectors of, of art more broadly. Um, and I would say this work um, gives any Damien Hirst or any Damien Hirst emulator kind of a serious run for their, their money in, in thinking about the kind of playing commodification in artwork and doing so in a way that isn't, um, that I find more stimulating and engaging perhaps than, than, than you might find for, for burning a large pile of NFTs. But that's, that's a side point, that's perhaps my personal taste. Um, so moving on from the kind of the, the slightly more confrontational work, perhaps, of, uh, or, or provocative work of Li Qingyi, uh, I want to draw your attention to this small work on, on my right, your left, um, to bring us back to something perhaps a bit more grounded, um, in a work of a young female artist, Cherry Chiu, who through um, Daphne's introduction, I've had a great pleasure to, to meet and, and visit her studio in Hong Kong last time I was there. And I think her practice is embedded with a, a kind of deep resonance with kind of local life in Hong Kong, with nostalgia and using her meticulous and highly accomplished training in Gongbi or fine brush painting um, at Chinese University Hong Kong to, to create these images that are at once kind of are deceptively simple again. That's a phrase I've used already, but here I'd apply it to say this is this is work that may appear kind of um, almost kind of kawaii, I guess in the Japanese term, kind of overly overtly cutesy. But I think kind of is layered with nostalgia, with um, local memory, and with a, a serious kind of engagement with the local, as experienced by this woman in her studio and in her practice in Hong Kong today. And I think in that sense, the seasonality, the material culture, and its visceral evocation in these lyrical, at times magical realist works that she produces are, are quite distinctive, and I'm really excited to see where, where she will develop in her career. I'm very excited to hear that Ali San has given her a a retrospective, well, a, a single artist show, not a retrospective, but, um, So I want to then come back uh, to Lin Huo Chung to bring us to the end of this section on colour. Um, as uh, this time I, I have the, uh, the caption right, this, this work is um, uh, ink and, uh, and watercolour on paper. Um, and you can see that synthesis once again in these two works, which you can see on the wall to your left. And again, that, the link here for me in, in terms of the works in the room is, is that kind of dreamlike ethereal quality and that bending of expectations that the artist is deliberately working with here, not simply through iconography and form, but through the associations of media. If you look closely, the watercolor that's used here creates the vanishing point recession of space, as well as the evocation of, of rocks as tangible and substantive forms. Whereas the ink serves a much more ambiguous purpose or dual purpose, at one level providing in cross-hatching kind of shading and effective light and volume to the space, but also if you look into the wall here, this kind of dreamlike growth that comes out of the, um, uh, the, the far back, the, the back of the, the, the image here, and kind of grows into the wall, creates these evocations of a more kind of um, interior psychological state. And that disparity in the functions of ink and color is perhaps linked to, um, or certainly, could be read to have a link to some forms of cultural signification or association, asking that question, kind of what does the Chinese in Chinese contemporary art do? Um, whether we still need it is still something of a moot point, but here at least it's worth, worth noting this. And I would stress as well, for those who are not so familiar with, um, with Chinese traditional media pigments, that watercolor, um, as traditionally defined, is not strictly the same as the pigments used in Chinese bo or traditional media painting. Water is not the primary binding agent in classical Chinese painting, as it were. That is achieved through a mix of animal glue dissolved alongside water and the organic and mineral pigments that are used to create that. So the, the opacity, the, the visual effects achieved by watercolor, shui tai, in, in this painting, are distinctive 
from what might initially be read by a, kind of, um, an audience new to, 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 to art from this kind of context as being traditionally a painting. So I want to move on then from the kind of papyrial graphic quality of Lin Guo Cheng's work to photography, um, here rendered by the, the Chinese term uh, yin or, or shadow uh, in its literal meaning. Um, and that notion of kind of reflection and refraction is something that really informs the practice of, of this artist, Yang Yong Liang. So in these two works, we see the artist that are his recent, his recent was written in 2021. Um, the macro format that you can see on the walls behind you uh, starts by giving us this almost immersive introduction to a simulated landscape space. Um, you can see a significant legacy of the art or significant impact of the artist in working with multiple media, um, the digital manipulation of images to create these synthetic landscape spaces which contain Techniques that appear to borrow from elements of, of, of painting, the Liu Bai reserve white of the um, photographic paper, creating um, segues, if you will, between the compositional space of the landscape structure. Um, but when we look closely at these landscapes, that initial kind of emotional affect of uh, what might be very loosely described as kind of a tranquil space is immediately ruptured for us. This is an unwavering. Um, if not critical, but documentary eye, looking at issues, conditions, and realities confronting China and indeed the world today. And um, if you look closely at both of these images, you'll see from their titles, Tiger and Falcon, um, the titular animals. I think this, to my eye, looks more like a bald eagle, but I'm not an ornithologist. Um, and then a, the tiger appears under that gnarled tree on the image on the right. They are embedded within these landscapes that are in the foreground constructed of um, granite and, uh, and limestone boulders from the look of things. But as you move back into the mountainscapes, you see that these mountainscapes are constructed from aggregate, um, an aggregate series of images of urban spaces, and some of them in states of demolition and, um, uh, and destruction. So there is, there is a quite powerful environmental message that underpins the artist's work here. And you can see in that when comparing it to um, um, one of his works that some of you may have seen in, in uh, about a decade ago, uh, the printed image in China, uh, the major exhibition at the British Museum, um, the, the artist is moving away from this kind of overt engagement with what we might call with the scare quotes around it, tradition, and instead moving towards something that is more ecologically urgent for the environmental crisis, the climate crisis that we are in now, and the particular manifestations that that takes in, in China through the, the the implicit but also explicit documentary function of photography, whilst also playing with photography's preconceived ability or, or, or function for us as a document of the real. You know, this is a composite image that is constructed deliberately and carefully by this multimedia artist that is evocative of themes and in so, in so doing, it reaches beyond the limitations of any documentary image of an animal in flight that it could achieve and communicates with us in a, in a very different register, uh, which is intrinsic to that mechanized lens-based media that Microsoft's AI picked out as the indicative image for contemporary art. Another artist who takes that sort of synergy of media and materials in a, in a different direction is Chu Chu. And you see her work here on the slide, but perhaps more effectively up on the wall. Many of you will have noticed it in prime position as you came into the room. And this work is, is richly rewarding for its, its longevity in a way, uh, the longevity of the process that underpins it. Produced, as the caption states, between 2007 and 2018, this represents this, um, hang, this young female, this female Hangzhou artist's uh, development over slightly more than a decade. Um, she has a, a, a rich training in multiple media, beginning initially with a, a greater focus on photography, but in 2015 completing a PhD with Professor Wang Gongling at the Hangzhou Chinese, at China Academy of Fine Art. And, and so you can see here the, kind of the way that Chu Chu has taken these different aspects of her practice and synthesized them together in the literal overlaying of calligraphy in acrylic on paper alongside ink interventions that preceded them. Um, as well as taking the underlying image of organic forms uh, drawn from photographic development on paper and kind of contortion of that image or 
contortion is perhaps a, a, a not an appropriate word, the manipulation of that image to create this quite dreamlike, certainly what to me reads as a very poetic space. And indeed the, the text inscribed on it is a translation of uh, a poem by Lord Byron that lends its title to the work here, She Walks in Beauty. So here is the, um, the space from which the image, which sits at the base of this kind of this, this, this work derives, the um, Lingyan Road in Hamdro. Uh, the maple trees here showing an autumn in an image from the internet. But um, some of you may know that the Lingyan, Lingyan Road leads to the Lingyan scenic area where the Lingyan Temple, um, uh, again, you know, maybe it's because I'm, you know, I'm drawn to them, but another link to, to, to a Buddhist space at least. But really that's somewhat unavoidable when you're working in Hamdro. And I think the intention here is not for a, a, anything specifically connected to that locality. And instead is about the beautiful organic form and its manipulation through photographic media and reproduction. And then the overlaying, though, of that process of movement, that idea of walking in the lyrical intervention translating by into poetry. So I think, um, well, before we get to that, I, I wanted to kind of give a nod to her teacher here, um, Professor Wang Dongling, who in 2016 produced this performance of um, Calligraphy in a Critic on Perspex at the BNA to Stop the Road. And I had a, the pleasure of being involved in that. So I think here we're looking at the, the teacher whose work, at least in this instance, is overtly quoting the first verse of one of the foundational texts of philosophical Taoism and producing it in something that is experimental and innovative in, in terms of its manipulation and use of media. <coughs> but Xu Xu's work goes several steps further in both using quoted poetry, adapting the color of the acrylic to, to this kind of explosive pink and interweaving it not only with a, a, a translucent surface, but actually combining it with the, um, the photographic process and the implied processes of memory and the unreliability of memory, the, or the, the way that memory develops and changes. Um, so here is, is the poem. Um, she walks in beauty like the night, of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright. Meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light, which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace, which waves in every raven tress of softly or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place, and on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, that tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful poem, but at least to my mind, there is a kind of tension there, even in the selection of the poem. The, the tone and tenor of this sits to me at odds slightly with the profound agency and experimental innovation of this artist, given the, um, at least the, the, the treatment of gender by Byron in that poem to me doesn't carry the, the kind of the, the same weight that we might want to lend to Chu Chu in her own innovative and profound creative practice. So in this work, we can see a series of animated figures within a landscape executed in a, a, a lightly impasto oil technique on canvas. Now that is partly the, the artist's kind of, you can tie that to the artist's individual preference and choice and the training available and the predilection for, for training in um, oil-based media in, um, in the time in which he was, he was initially trained. Um, but in contemporary practice, I think it's more connected to the, that diasporic um, kind of globalized peripatetic existence that, that he lives today, perhaps, that the choice of oil is the, the chosen media for this artist for, for the suitability to the, the many contexts in which he displays and exhibits. Um, but to come to the specific imagery that we see here, um, these two figures that we find, the first thing that struck me about them was their, how animated they were, how alive, how in movement, and indeed that they are not only alive themselves, but tending to living things, um, cultivating things that are growing in these, these plant pots and planters and, and in the blossoms that surround the, the woman on the left of the scene here. So this is a particular representation of a, a feminine ideal that we can trace back all the way to uh, the Tang Dynasty, represented here by our neighbours in the V&A, and uh, a collection object of a figure of a noble woman in earthenware with pigments. 
And one of the things that I think both the media of oil painting itself as, a, uh, as a material firmly associated with narrative and with, with kind of immediate presence, um, but also the kind of the, the manner in which the figures have been represented takes us away from many associations that might come from images like this that we see on the left, um, figurines produced for a tomb context. Um, so we're, we're moving from a, a historical space of, um, that, is, that is dark and dead and closed, and perhaps there is a, some kind of afterlife implied within it, but it's, it's nothing to the vitality of the image that we see on the right here, where we see this overt play and integration of um, different pictorial structures and compositional structures to render the composition. But to come back to what I, what I kind of invited you, or we, what you come here to hear about material and technique, if you look at the surface of the painting, there's a kind of link back to the, the historicity of the subject, or at least something that I would say may carry that meaning in the, um, uh, the abrasion of the surface to some extent, to create this almost fresco-like effect on the surface of the oil painting, which lends a, um, a different kind of antique flavor that we, we might accept. But I want to finish with perhaps one of the, uh, the most significant works in, in this exhibition, uh, the artist Qi Yi, it's Blue Rain Number no. 1, you can see on the wall up here. Um, Qi Yi was a, a very significant artist who very sadly recently passed away, and I present her work here as a kind of reminder of the importance of, well, I think we, should, we can take it as a reminder of the importance of abstraction uh, as a separate practice from many of the figurative practices we've been looking at here. Um, and I was really grateful to, to Daphne and to Ali San for putting this artist at the front of my attention, but also this exhibition that some of you may have seen um, that took place down the road or down, down the district line, um, um, Action, Gesture and Paint, that was held first at the Whitechapel Art Gallery. And it, the subtitle is Women Artists and Global Abstraction, 1940 to 1970. And this exhibition uh, prefaced by none other than Grisel de Pollock, features Qing Yi's work. So it's a reminder that there are, while this room brings together a group of artists and art objects that have an overt shared cultural heritage um, and linguistic heritage perhaps in the way that they communicate and construct meaning, um, they are by no means limited or constrained by that. And Qing Yi for us shows, shows the importance of contributions of artists from that greater China region who communicate through active participation in a globalized milieu of artists and artistic practices, which can be celebrated and seen very much in that vein. So to conclude, I've not really answered my own question, um, my opening rhetorical question, you know, do we need to keep Chinese in front of Chinese contemporary art? And it's perhaps a question that doesn't lend itself to easy, to easy resolution. But I hope that the works discussed today show how we can examine and interrogate or, or perhaps question the use of that term, apply it where it is appropriate and, um, and enrich it in our understanding without undermining or detracting from the unique voices, the local and global experiences and contributions that these various artists make. Um, and indeed, the, the manner in which the concepts and illusions that they provide us with enrich a collective understanding across borders of culture and, and geography to communicate our shared human experience. So thank you very much for joining us this evening and thank you to Daphne for the opportunity. I'd like to ask if Dr. Daphne would like to join me maybe for the Q&A for a second. We have a question too. Do you want to start with questions from the floor? Do you mind going? So, yeah, so, um, yeah, Malcolm just ask me a few questions, and then after that, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. I just, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm here to facilitate the dialogue, and I think there is such a kind of richness of, I, I wanted to hear what Daphne had to say as well, as well as kind of taking the stage myself. So, so, Daphne, could you tell us a bit more about how you work with the various artists in this room, including the ones that I've, uh, I've been speaking to, and perhaps some others as well. What's the, what's your kind of, What's the, the practicality of how you kind of in, bring these works from the studio into the space here in from office? Well, um, so I've actually been very lucky because the gallery, as I mentioned before, was founded over 40 years ago, and it was founded by my mother, Alice King, 
And a lot of the artists that we're working with, including ones here in the room, such as Ching Yi um, and Wallace Ting, uh, even Wang Tinda, we, she had been working with them already by the time I took over the gallery more than 10 years ago. Uh, she had created a very strong foundation. And so some of the artists, uh, like Wallace Ting and Ching Yi that I mentioned, they were at the time, I wouldn't say young, but they were not as well established as they were now. And in fact, they're, both of them have passed away already. So now I'm working together with the foundation uh, or the estates of the family to help promote and preserve the legacy of the artist. So in that sense, I've been very lucky to you know, kind of inherit this wonderful um, foundation and be able to work with these artists. But of course, there's you know, younger artists like Chu Chu that you mentioned. Um, I met her through, a lot of the artists that I meet are through recommendations of other artists. So Wang Dongling, who is his, her teacher, uh, we knew and we had worked with before, and he uh, suggested that I meet Chu Chu and include her in our new, you know, in, in our gallery. So I met her, I went to Hangzhou, I did a studio visit. Uh, usually for me, I always want to meet the artists in person because I don't really care how famous or Establish the artists are and how you know how much the painting is going for if I don't meet the artists and I don't know them or I don't really like them per se I'm not gonna bring them into my gallery I think that's something really important that you need to be able to get along with the artist uh, and to, because at the end of the day you're working together I know unlike a lot of the bigger galleries we actually don't sign any formal contracts with these artists because it's my belief, we're very old school, we've been in business for so long, but it's all about trust and relationship building. So if I sign a contract with some of these artists and later we have a falling out, they're just not gonna give me any work or they'll give me things that are not nice and I wouldn't be able to sell them. So to me, there's really no point. It's all about trust and relationship and that's how that's kind of how I work and how we bring, bring the artwork into the gallery. And really enjoyed working. That actually for me, the best part of working in a gallery is meeting the artists, going to their studio, understand, trying to understand what they're doing and help promote you know, what they believe in. Yeah. Um, can I ask one more question before we turn to you? So you talked about working with them in, in the studio visits. Do you, do you ever get actively involved in their creative process in any way? Or can I say, well, perhaps you could pursue more of this direction, more of that direction? Are there artists for whom you're like, well, they know what they're going to do, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Are there other younger artists who you can help them to develop in that way? What's your, how, how involved are you in that active creative process as well as the, the providing of a platform and creating of a visibility for them? Yeah, I think I'm like the latter where I kind of just believe that the artist can create and I don't really want to interfere with mm -hmm. their creation because I feel that sometimes you stifle their creativity. Mm -hmm. But as I've been in the business longer and longer, I realize that some of the young artists do kind of come to me and ask for advice. They're like, do you think I should go in this direction or do you think I should go in that direction? So in that sense, with the younger artists, I do try to guide them a little bit, but really you know, making sure that I don't stifle their creativity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of you. Does anyone have any questions? In the front room. It's, it's a comment and a question. Sure. You opened with Chinese contemporary art and what's the difference between that and contemporary art. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at this painting here and then I read the title, She Walks in Beauty Like the Night. Mm -hmm. So a Westerner reading the title would immediately make that association between, I'm thinking, is that Shelley, is that Byron, 19th century mm -hmm. romantic art, right? He automatically make it. But as a Westerner who doesn't read or write Chinese, I look at that and I thought, are they ideograms or are they not ideograms? Mm. So, because you kept using the signifier, signifier, so it was bringing up the orthographic system. Yeah, true. So, why did the, why do you think the artist gave it the name of a 19th century? Well, the, the poem that's written on it is a translation of that poem. So the, the calligraphy, the, the painting. So that is calligraphy. That is calligraphy. Um, it's very much 
derived from, yeah, a very much developed as part of her, her doctoral practice, and then informing her, her earlier work. So the pink text is, is the glue for that. So are they like simplified characters that um, any Chinese person could read the poem? Well, I think it's... Yes, you can read that. <laughs> Yeah. Some of it. I think if thinking, thinking about one of the characters. Yeah. And what does that suggest to you? Because did you know the? Did you know it was from a 19th century English? If you try, if you try to read the Chinese, yeah. it's some sort of like excerpt or part of the Chinese translation of the poem. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of it, there's a word line. So if you map back onto the poem of the translation, you will find the sense that it goes along around it. That's it. But you can't really read what. Exactly the word because it's so fully graphic in the way that maybe people who write in the British and read better than I do. Mm. I mean, uh, to, sp to speak to her teacher and yeah. his practice, Wang Gongling, to the image I showed you of the performance yeah. of the DNA, I remember when, when Professor Wang was doing that, um, he, he started and for the first few characters I could read what he said. Yeah. And, and it's a very, you know, so many people have memorized that text. That's something I had to study in classical Chinese as an undergraduate. It's, 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 it's rooted, the text is there. But as he accelerated, he, he kind of moved into a deliberate illegibility of what he describes as a, um, a chaos script, is actually the term he uses for his most cursive form of calligraphy. Yeah. And, and so here, this is not chaos script. This is like that guang in the middle that David just pointed out in the white space or the, the kind of lighter space is this overt positioning. So there's a kind of it's not overdetermined, I think, in the way that it seems to work here. There's there's illusion, there's layering, um, but it's not it's not a document, right? This is not it's not written as a kind of uh, a rendition of the poem to be immediately read. But no, no, it's, it's it's that integration of poetry and painting and calligraphy here, but in a way that is completely new media, if you will. The, the kind of the acryl the pink acrylic and the um, the photographic underlying image. And also the kind of taking up of that earlier photographic practice and layering new practice. And for me, that's one of the things that makes it such an impactful and interesting work. And, and I also personally, I just really love the pink one. I think it really pops. But, yeah, um, okay. So, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, we had a question from the robot. How would you comment on, for example, colors mm -hmm. of the work that is produced digitally? How would I comment on because colors? Yeah, the, the work is produced digitally. Yeah. Oh, Oh, sorry, the color is so precise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, how would you comment on that? Well, I think, like, you've got that sort of, that, that trope of, you know, um, the, the oratic effect of the artwork is still there, even in what we might call it, you know, the age of mechanical reproduction, to go all the way back to kind of early 20th century questions about photography. Um, the short answer is, I think that the color still, it's about the, the relationship with the viewer to the artwork, for me. Um, Color, color still speaks to us, even if it's achieved through digital means. And I think it's partly about the kind of what we, what our preconceptions are of the object that's using that color in a way. So it, it, it's doing some. The pink in uh, Lee Shin Yi's kind of luxury brand flower image is doing something very different than the kind of opaque, um, hazy color in Yang Yongliang's um, syncretic kind of landscape in the upper right. If you look at the wall over there, those are. Those are both uses of color in a way, but they're, they're doing very different things and communicating very different things. But they, they both share something in how they communicate with us because there is a, a kind of oratic effect of the artwork, right? And it's, it's <coughs> by being around something that has so much thought, intention, and, um, and, te and, and for me, I mean, again, this is speaking subjectively, not as a kind of, you know, for me, one of the things that the technical mastery of whatever the media is that the artist has choose to use to deploy that, whether it's the synthesis of multiple photographic images and the manipulation of printing technique, or whether it's the application of um, Japanese mineral pigment and acrylic paint combining them together to create something that is kind of explosive but also glittering with a with a manual technique, both of those are really effective. So for me, the 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 fact of it being a kind of intentionally created, deliberate artwork in that sense gives it gives it an artistic quality. If you're talking about kind of what does can we do new colors? Like, of course, absolutely. Changes in technology change what's possible, and I think that you know the the, the choice to use that extra, almost explosive pink in, in the flower on the wall over there is 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 partly so eye catching because it's a departure from what you might find in in traditional media painting in Bohua, even in Dojo Kwan's kind of um, blossoming lotus heads. You don't have something. At least nothing you can correct me if I'm wrong, but nothing that like 
I, you know, explosive, if you will. Maybe I use the word explosive quite a lot, but something so, so sensuous, to be honest, in a way. And to come back to that use of the term so, as, as color, but also kind of a, a, a visceral meaning of color as well. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> So you're asking, this is a question for the audience, how do people... No, it's actually a, a poll or something. Um, yeah. How do these examples of like audience or audience, how do they respond to these Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it definitely people respond differently. I think if you have a Chinese or a cultural, you know, you have a cultural background, you don't have to be Chinese, but if you have a knowledge of Chinese culture, mm -hmm. you would respond quite differently to the work hanging on the wall versus somebody who doesn't have a background. They don't, and, and I don't think one is necessarily better than the other, and I think that comes back to the question of like Chinese contemporary art versus contemporary art. Like, do we need to put that Chinese there? Do we need to, do people need to have that background to understand the painting? I mean, some of them, yeah, but I think not all of, not all of the artwork that's hanging here on the wall, um, I mean, yeah, maybe like say Wang Tianzi, the way Malcolm explained it, and he brought it back to you know more classical Chinese painting. Maybe if you didn't have that background, you wouldn't mm -hmm. know those nuances. But then, does that mean that you can't appreciate the artwork as much? I think yeah. I mean, you could put Wang Tianzi in a very different context. You know, I I'm trained as an art historian in looking at classical Chinese painting and calligraphy. That's kind of my that's my natural point of departure, even though I'm Scottish. So let's leave that on the side here, as mm -hmm. that was the kind of premise of your question. Um, but you could equally talk about that work solely through presence and absence, through the presence and ethereal presence of what lies underneath it, and talk about it in a very, um, very much to do with kind of processes of destruction as creativity, without making any kind of reference to classical Chinese landscape painting idioms. They enrich it, but they are the ground upon which the artistic practice is taking place. That it's the, the, the exciting thing about the work, that work in my view, the, the innovative thing, I think the reason why Wang Tiendo is so widely collected is not because using incense to burn paper makes significantly better ink painting than anyone's done before. It's because conceptually it enriches art practice in a way that is innovative and original and exciting. And that's what's made him so popular. It's not that the, the ink idiom is brought to a new level necessarily as the, the kind of the practice itself is. I mean, it's a bit of both, I guess, but mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't need to see it in that way. It's just that's my wheelhouse, as it were. Is that a fire alarm? Yeah. Or a car alarm? <laughs> Let's presume it's a car alarm outside. Until we're talking about this. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I make a living by associating the artist with the by assuming that you require some degree of training in order to also access it as well. So I, I, it, it is universal, absolutely, and there, there are kind of different entry points, but I think that's the, um, if I could respond to your question kind of from the point of view of an educator and kind of who comes into my classroom and who brings what different perspective, everyone brings a different body of, of kind of embodied expertise, embodied knowledge, cultural knowledge, whether they're coming as an active participant in Chinese calligraphy, a practitioner of Chinese calligraphy into an, an NA class at SOAS, or whether they're coming as someone with a kind of a background in, in European printmaking or in, in fine art, whatever it may be. So yeah, everyone, everyone brings something different to that conversation. And I think it's about bringing those ways of seeing together. And you see that synergy again and again and again in all the things that are around the wall here. So, so the kind of syncretic approach really helps. One, one really great example, I think it was, I forget which museum it was, it might have been the Brooklyn Museum or maybe the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, but they exhibited a collaborative piece produced during the COVID pandemic um, made in combination by Michael Cherney and Arnold Jan. Um, and it's a really interesting thing because for those who know these two artists, Michael Cherney is based in Beijing, um, or was at the time the artwork was made, and works in eight <coughs> idioms. And Arnold Jan is, a, um, a, is of Chinese descent but based in the US. And their collaborative artwork together was described by an artist based in upstate New York and in Beijing, uh, working collaboratively across the pandemic. And it, you know, it was, it was about the geographic locus and space in which they happened to be working at that time. I remember reminded that these you know, contemporary, art, contemporary artists are really mobile globally and, and, and where they are inflects um, what they do in many ways as much as kind of where they come from.
Um, just to say, you know, do, do take a look. And thank yes. you, Daphne, so thank much. Thank you. For thank you so much, Malcolm. We really enjoyed that. Thank you.